I want to talk a little about science and Torah. Um, we often consider, of course, the Limit Torah. We, we learn, you learn Chumash, you learn Gemara, you learn Mishnayis, Halacha. And then there's Limit Echayel. There are the secular studies, which we often view as, real, as separate entities. And, but as we will see, that very much, in order to understand parts of the Torah, one needs to understand science. And it works the other way too. From the Torah itself, we learn out various aspects of, of science. It's just as a, as a side note, we should take note, there was a, a, a big um, Torah scholar, Rabbi Belsky, Rabbi Israel Belsky, who passed away Thursday night. He was actually the Paisic. He was one of the decisors of law for the Orthodox Union, for the OU, the Kashas Agency in, in New York. I actually worked for the Star K in Baltimore, but actually my beginning years of Kashas, I began with the OU. And I had the, the opportunity to work very close um, under Rabbi Belsky. We would go to him for questions that came up uh, as what to do. Rabbi Belsky was famous for his knowledge of science. And, and he knew anatomy, and he knew science, and he knew botany. They say the, the boys who went to Camp Aguda, where he was the Rav of Camp Aguda in the summer for close to 50 years, reminisce about how he would take them out into the field and look at all the stars. And uh, Somebody even told me last night that he... He was taking a walk and he says, that star doesn't belong there. Something doesn't make sense. <coughs> and he called up, uh, you know, and, and they told him, you're right, that star only appears every hundred years and no one really knows about it. And he actually picked out of the sky that there's something, uh, that was his, and he knew plants, what you could eat, what you can't eat. He was a tremendous, knew a tremendous uh, amount of science. And in fact, at his uh, funeral yesterday, which I didn't attend, but it was, it was carried, it was streamed in, I listened to, to a good part of it. One of, his, one of his sons said he knew so much science, but yet I never remember a science book. Um, I think he had Scientific America, maybe, that he would get the magazine, but I never remember a science book that, in the house at all that was there. And yet he knew from Tyre itself, he was able to pick up so many, so many, so many, so much knowledge of, of, of the Tyre. So that's what we're going to do a little bit of that tonight. We're going to talk about the various aspects of, of the Tyre itself. We're coming up on, um, in the next couple of weeks, we're coming up in Parsh's Truma. Uh, a week from, uh, two weeks, two weeks from now, Parshat Shuma speaks about the Beis Hamikdash, the, the temple, and of course one of the it talks about the various kalim, the various objects that were the, the holy items that were in the Beis Hamikdash, the Mizbeach, the altar, and of course probably the most famous part of the Beis Hamikdash that we know of is the Menorah, because the Menorah we celebrate Hanukkah and we, we have our, our own Menorah, which of course dates back to the celebration of the of the, of the Hanukkah Habayis of Hanukkah, which we were all familiar with, the Menorah. But it's interesting, the Menorah itself, the Beis HaMikdash, actually symbolized the various chachmas, the various knowledge of, of, of the world. And the middle branch represents Tyra. Right? The middle branch represents Tyra. And the, the, the other branches represent the other chachmas. They represent the other knowledge of the world. So the science and mathematics. And it's explained that the, the, the center of all of the branches of the Menorah branched out from the middle branch. The middle branch was this Torah, from, from which came off of the Torah was all the different chachmas, all the different sciences and mathematics and, and world knowledge, because every, any, you can learn anything from Torah. You have the, if a person who studies Torah from, from all the various aspects can learn all the various parts of science. And furthermore, is that the, the chachmas turned in, the, 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 the Naira sort of pointed in, the light pointed back into the center to show that the purpose of these chachmas is to serve Torah, that if I know math, if I understand science, I'm able to learn parts of the Torah very carefully and, and, and know them better. And therefore, it's, 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 the Menorah really represents the, uh, this, this aspect. One of the areas, just I'm, I'm not a doctor, but just, just to go highlight a few, I want to focus mainly on, on, uh, on astronomy, which relates to the calendar, maybe a little chemistry, which relates to kashas, but just as an introduction, just one aspect of, 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 of medicine, that we find the, 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 in, in the Torah, in the Gemara, the Gemara talks about, um, it, it, it doesn't mention the word DNA, but it actually alludes to the concepts of DNA that Chazal, the, the old rabbis of the Gemara of 2,000 years ago understood. The Gemara over there is talking about if, if a child had a bris, had a, had a circumcision, and God forbid died, he died, knew he bled, he was unable to, to, they couldn't control the bleeding. And, and if, the, if they have a second child and they do the bris, and there's another this next child, God forbid, bleeds to death. So the so the, the Gemara says the next child is potter, is exempt. Don't do the bris. 
Because if there's two brothers, well, one time you say something's wrong, you don't, you, know, you don't know what it is. And there's three there before testing, and they say, okay, if it happens twice, so then you don't do it because this third child, you're, you're not obligated to a bris. If it's no, you're not obligated to give up your life for, for mitzvahs except the three carnal sins. Idolatry, adultery, and, and murder. Those are the only three of errors a person is obligated to give up their life. For bris milah, you're not obligated to give up your life. So you can't, you can't put in danger this child. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. Don't endanger this child. But the Gemara says something very interesting. The Gemara then says, if you had two sisters, and one sister, two sisters, Rachel and Leah, and their sisters, and Rachel had a boy, and they, 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 they did the bris, and the child bled to death, and then they did a bris, Leah then has a boy, and then also, God forbid, this terrible tragedy happens, then if either Rachel and Leah have a child, they turn to a bris. Don't do a bris, the Gemara says. So the question is, well, what do you mean? It's, it's sisters. But the, you see from the Gemara, you see they understood DNA. This is from, I believe, I once heard, sounds as if it's accurate, but it's from the earliest, the earliest discussions of, of, of family illnesses where the Chazal understood this hemophilia. In fact, hemophilia runs in, in, through it's the mothers, women are the carriers. So Chazal understood that, that, hey, you know, you have two sisters here and each of them have this illness in their family. This was way ahead of their times. Today it's already, of course, everybody, everybody knows this. This is common, common uh, uh, medicine. But this, we're talking about the Gemara, which was some 1,500, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 years ago. The Maroim already had this understanding of these aspects of DNA. It's truly amazing. Did it work that, with two brothers? That this, the, well, I, can't, I can't. I have to look at this and close it. It does not work. Two brothers, no, because Taka, nowadays, you don't have this aspect of... Um, of, in fact, if it's two brothers, they're not carriers. In other words, if two brothers have right. a problem, Allah, and Allah question. also, the Gemara only talks about two sisters, hmm. right? We had two, we had two sisters that were there. Uh, excuse me, I thought my phone was down, but I wasn't able. Um, if we have two sisters, then then it doesn't apply. It only it only applies by two sisters. Does not apply. Does not apply by two brothers. Fine. Now. One aspect of math, which I always like to mention, of course, the, the Torah is replete with mathematics, a discussion of mathematics. There, there are two areas that they're most commonly addressed, as in Sakta Erevin, which talks about building an Erev, where you have all sorts of mathematical uh, uh, aspects uh, that come up, and uh, where the string, and, the, and, the, and where it goes, and Tchumen, which is, relates to how far a person is allowed to travel on Shabbos, and then Sukkah, as well, if you build a sukkah, sukkah has to be a certain size. What if you build a sukkah that's round? How do you how do you calculate that? So the, the Gemara sukkah discusses pi. We're all familiar with pi. I come from St. Louis. St. Louis is the city of pi because the area code is three one four, which is uh, right. We're coming up to March fourteenth in a couple of months. So that's International Pi Day, right? Because it's 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 pi three point one four three point one four one five. What what's but. There's a discussion in the Gemara that talks about pi as being three, it's rounded off. Of course, pi has to be rounded at some point, because if you would run the number pi, it would, it, would, it would be an infinite number that would go around the globe, if you would, if you would have the exact number to pi. Now they have computers that could calculate it to, to tens of hundreds of thousands of digits. But, but very interesting, so, so Chazal really rounded it. And we find many times in halacha, certain things are rounded for simplicity. You, you, you could sacrifice under certain conditions, Accuracy for simplicity, which is a whole other discussion. But Chazal rounded it up. The guy, the Vilna guy, the great guy from Vilna, in uh, Vilnius in Lithuania, made an unbelievable insight. The Gemara over there discusses um, the, the Yam Shal Shlema, which was a round aspect of Shlema HaMelech, and it was it was it's discussing the construction of the of the Beis Hamikdash, uh, which we spoke about Parshas Truma, which was the Mishkan, but in Malachim, in, in the Book of Kings. It discusses the construction of the Beis Hamikdash. In fact, the various haftarahs that we read Shabbos morning that come from those prokim and malachim, Vayakel uh, and which we'll, this year we'll read them because it's uh, um, at least one of them we'll read, and, and you have also um, other Shminat Saras. There are other days where we read this in the haftarah of Shabbos morning. But anyway, in, in, in one of those psukim, it brings a, 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 it talks about a line, and it says. It, again, it's, 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 and, and the Gemara makes certain calculations from this Pasuk in, in dealing with pi. In dealing with pi as far as the round and how what the area is and what the, what the circumference is and so on. But in there, very interesting, we have, they talk about a line. And the word in Hebrew for a line is a kav. A line is a kav, spelled kuv vav. 
called Chavav. Now, in, in, in the Torah, we know that there's, there's, there's what's known as a Korean Exiv. There are various Pesukim in the Torah that sometimes the Torah writes one way, a word, but yet it's read a different way. And it's, it's called a Kri and a Ksiv, which means the way it's written, when you look at the letters, it says one thing, but when the Balkaire, when the reader, when the Torah reader reads it out loud in, in, in the synagogue, or when a person's reading it, it's said differently. It's said differently. So in other words, you're not reading exactly what it says, but rather that's called a Kri and a Ksiv. Right? This, it's read one way and it's said one way. And there's a purpose for this because what the Torah is trying to point out is that there's, there's really two, the Torah is trying to make two points. There's, there's one way to read it, one way to say it, and therefore there's different sometimes definitions of a Korean exiv, and therefore it's, it's bringing out two, two aspects. You want to learn out two different things from this possible. That's the, that's the purpose of the Korean, to read exiv and the way it's written. The word kav in, in Malachim is actually a Korean exiv. And it's actually written it's written kuf, kuf vav hey. That's the way it's written, but it's pronounced kav, which is kuf vav. Now, you're familiar with gematrias, right? Gematrias are, 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 every letter has a number. Aleph is one, and base is two, and yud is ten, chaf is twenty, and, and resh, uh, kuf is a hundred, and resh is two hundred. Every letter is a number. So many, many people, darshan with gematrias, when, when you go to shower brachas, people, people, two people get married, people try to make calculations to, to prove that there's a great cost of the kalo because then you add up this and this number and that number. Gematrias are, are, are very widespread of, 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 of there's certain halachas even that are discussed. It's, it's used. But the guy makes an unbelievable insight into this creed of Ksiv. He says that the, the way it's written is, is, is and the guy lived over 200 years ago. The guy writes, it's written Kuvav He. The gematria of Kuvav He is 111. 111. But it's pronounced without the He. It's pronounced Kav, which is just Kuvav. The gematria of Kuvav is, is 106. So the guy, unbelievable, says, if you take, you take Kavei and divide it by Kav, you take 111 and divide it by 106, and then you multiply by 3, which is what the rounded pi is, you get 3.1415. It says, so, so hinted, the guy says, unbelievable, in this Pasuk and Navi, the Pasuk and Navi from, from Olochem, which was written thousands of years ago, it, it hit, hidden, if you take these, the way it's written and the way it's spelled, and you divide one by the other, and you, and you get multiplied by three, which is really pi. And that it's not just two; it's not just a pasuk in Tanakh of, 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 of prophets. That's just oh, very interesting. This is the pasuk where pi. The Gemara speaks about pi. This, it's not just a pasuk. Oh, very interesting. I took two words and it divided. The very pasuk that the that the Gemara, the Talmud addresses, that we see, we learn our pi from. That very pasuk hinted the guy said is the number pi. So you see, just another amazing fact of how Chazal and the sciences and the mathematics were, were so critical. One, one of the important sciences, though, maybe, in fact, the most important science that, that relates to us on an, on an ongoing basis is the science of astronomy. Astronomy happens and it really has a tremendous impact on, on us as, as Yidin, as Jews, in our, in our performance of mitzvahs, in our serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There are three, there are many activities that go on in, 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 in the heavens, in the sky that take place. There are three events or three rotations that occur that have a direct impact on us on a regular basis. I want to speak about those three rotations and some just some highlights of some various halachas, some Jewish law that relates to them. The first is the earth is spinning on its axis. The earth spins on its axis and that takes that takes 24 hours. That takes 24 hours to happen. Now, within that, that 24 hours, um, there are many various halachas that occur that are important to, to, for us to know. As we'll see, the days start, and we'll, we'll elaborate a little bit. Let me just highlight all three, and then we'll elaborate. The, the, the fact that Earth spins on its axis takes 24 hours, that has a tremendous impact on our davening. When do you daven chakras in the morning? When does that happen? You can't daven chakras now. It's dark. Why is it dark now? Because the sun set. Why the sun set? Because the Earth is spinning on its axis. It takes 24 hours. When the sun comes up tomorrow morning, I can daven chakras. When the sun went down, when the sun is a little bit after midday, when the sun is at the highest point in the sky for that day, it's actually due south. If you ever want to know which way is north, and you know when midday is, the sun in the northern hemisphere, north of 22 degrees, is always going to be um, is always going to be in the southern sky. So if you went outside today at noon, which today in Baltimore noon was about 12:20, 12:20, you go outside at 12:20, the sun is the southern point of the sky, your shadow pointed north. 
but you can't do Mincha, you got to wait a half hour to do Mincha, now you don't want to do So this rotation on this earth on its axis has an important impact on when I dive it. Furthermore, every seven days, the sun sets, and of course we have the Shabbos. And now we just made Abdullah, that, that was the end of Shabbos, it's, it's the next day, it's the beginning of the first day of the week. Hayyagah Risha B'Shabbos, today is the first day, counting up towards Shabbos. Some actually say when you say the Yayim and Davin in the morning, you are fulfilling the mitzvah of this morning that we blame. Zachar Sema Shabbos, the Kadshay, according to Ramban, remember the Shabbos day. We as Yidin remember Shabbos every day. Because on Sunday, we say Hayyim, Yayim, Risha B'Shabbos. Today is the first day to Shabbos. And on Monday, we'll say Hayyim, Yayim, Shayim B'Shabbos. Today is, is the second day and the third day until we finally reach Shabbos. And well, what, what determined that t- tomorrow is Sunday? Well, because the sun set tonight, and it's going to rise tomorrow, and that's the beginning of Sunday, and, and, and so on. The, the second rotation is the moon around the earth. The moon around the earth takes, takes 29, 29 and a half days, approximately. We'll see the exact number in a moment. And that, of course, has an impact upon my, upon the Rosh Chodesh, upon the new month. By Yidin, you know, the term month really comes from moon, but in the secular calendar, the civil calendar, it's really off, because the months could be 30 days, 31 days, and that needed to be done in order to, to, to make, to, that it should work out with this solar year, so they actually fidgeted with the month, and now their months are, are longer. But our months revolve directly around Rosh Chodesh, around the new moon that comes once a month. Our Rosh Chodesh always occurs on or, or a day or two after the time of the new moon, because we, we work by the moon, Klai so it goes by the moon, the is right, which we, which we learned a few weeks ago, we, we work by the, by the new month, and therefore that rotation has a tremendous impact on when the month begins, and of course Rosh Chaydesh is critical for my entire month, because I need to know when to celebrate the Yom Taivim, which is, Purim is going to be the 14th of Adar, and Pesach is going to be the 15th of Nisan, and Rabbi Si's son, who's Bar Mitzvah, how does, how does he know when his Bar Mitzvah is? He knows his birthday, his Hebrew birthday is going to be on Yud, Adar. Yud, Yud, right? Yud on the 10th day of Adar, and therefore, more on that later, which Adar? We have to talk about that later, right? But Lamaisa, the, the Yud, Adar, well, how do we know when Yud Adar is? Because we know when Rosh Chaydash is. We know when the first day of Adar is, so he'll know when his Bar Mitzvah is, and so on and so forth. The third rotation is the, is this, the Earth around the Sun, which is actually the basis of the civil calendar that we have. That's why we have a, a leap year. 2016 is a leap year because it takes 300, approximately 365 days and 6 hours. More on that later. It's actually a little, bit, it's a little bit short. We'll talk about that if we have time. It's a little bit short. But that is, the, that is the civil year, which is 365 days. Every fourth year, there's an extra day. That's the civil calendar. But even for Yidin, that's very critical because that determines the seasons. The fact that it takes the seasons will revolve around the way the Earth goes around the Sun, and therefore the seasons are a function, and we need to know seasons because we can only celebrate Pesach in the spring, and therefore it's very important. So let, let's highlight some of these, just some very important aspects of these various signs and its impact upon us. First, let's talk about the moon going around the earth. That's, that, that is the basis for our month. It takes 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and, and three and a third seconds for the moon to go around, around the, the, the earth. Every month, in fact, we announce what's known as the Milat. There's always a moment that as you look outside, you'll see the moon, it gets bigger and larger, and then it's a full moon, and then it starts to get smaller and smaller. It wanes and gets smaller. We're actually now in the waning days of the moon, um, where it's getting smaller, and eventually it'll be Rosh Chaydesh. Rosh Chaydesh it, before Rosh Chaydesh, those last days, at the end of the month, you cannot see the moon. If you're lucky, early in the morning, you, could, you see a sliver in the sky, and then it disappears. Because what happens is the moon, the earth, and the sun are all aligned up, and now you don't, you're looking at the dark side of the moon, and you can't see anything until, lo and behold, there's a little sliver. In the days of the Beis HaMikdash, and, and even after the Beis HaMikdash, until the year 359 of the Common Era, they would actually sight the new moon, they would come to Beis, into the court in Shalayim, and they would, they would discuss what they saw and how they saw it, what it looked like, and they would declare the new moon, the new month, and they would now know when all the, all the holidays occurred. In the year 359, and of course shortly before that, Hill Hashani, they determined that you know it was very difficult because Yerushalayim was under siege. The Beis Hamikdash had been destroyed already. The Temple had been destroyed over 200 years earlier, close to 300 years before, and things were getting too difficult. And they recognized that the ability to declare the new month is going to be too difficult. We need to be Mekadesh Al Pi which means we have to declare the new month 
by calculation. We have to calculate every new moon. And they sat and they based and said, okay, we're now going to, until Mashiach comes, we're declaring every month. So this coming month, we started Shvat on Monday, a few weeks ago. The first day of Shvat, that was declared by that based in way back, um, some 1,600 years ago, that Rosh Chodesh Shvat is going to be on Monday, and Rosh Chodesh Adar, the first Adar is going to be on Tuesday and Wednesday, which is going to come a week from Tuesday, a week from Wednesday, and they declare that. We reenact that. Every Shabbos Bevarchim, those who go to Shul, the Shabbos before Rosh Chodesh, we, we actually, the Chazan gets up, he holds the Sefer Torah, and he declares Rosh Chodesh, he'll say this Shabbos will be Rosh Chodesh Bevarchim, Rosh Chodesh Adar, Arishai, Yihiyah, the first Rosh Adar, the Rosh Chodesh will be um, on the third day, on the fourth day, Tuesday and Wednesday, it should come to us. Um, it, should be, it should be for a blessing. It should be good for us. That's a reenactment of, of, of the basin. Now, Chazal had to keep very cal- careful. Chazal, the rabbis, had to keep very cal- careful calculation of this because you have to have Rosh Chaydash has to come around the time of the new moon. You can't have it. Not like that. And therefore, the calculation was unbelievable. I heard Rabbi Diskin mentioning as I came in that this, but there's a book that I saw in, uh, in, in um, the, 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 the authors from Johns Hopkins University, it was published by Johns Hopkins University, it's called Medieval Chronicles and the Rotation of the Earth. And he notes that the fantastic accuracy of the month seems to exceed the level of knowledge in the 4th century. In other words, the, what they knew in the 4th century in making this calendar, Al-Pi the, the, the number was so accurate that it was amazingly ahead of their time. He writes by saying it's probably accidental, right? <coughs> but we know that this was Messiah, this was passed down. They knew these calculations because the, the Rebbe Shalom had passed it down, God had passed it down, and they knew this. Chazal had these tremendous understanding and, and the knowledge. And therefore, this Mailad, this new moon, the, new, the moment of the new moon, is a very important time that we, we, we announce. The most important mailad of the of the mailad does have, have an impact on when we recite Kiddush Lavana, which is a blessing recited on the new moon. But most important is the mailad for the month of Tishrei. Everybody knows the month of Tishrei is when Rosh Hashanah is. When the mailad of Tishrei occurs, we need to know that time. That's a critical time in the calendar because when the mailad of Tishrei occurs, that's the day Rosh Hashanah occurs. And once we know Rosh Hashanah, then the rest of the year falls into place. Once you know this Rosh Hashanah, next Rosh Hashanah, you then lay out the entire calendar, because most months have a set number of days. The month of Shvat is always 30 days, and the month of Adar Rishon, the first Adar, is 30 days, and the regular Adar, which is the Purim Adar, is 29 days, and Nisan is 30 days, and year is 29 days. So everything is set. There are two months that could pivot, Cheshvan and Kislev, or Cheshvan and Kislev, which already, Kislev is what Hanukkah is, that, already, that could be pivotal, it could be 29 and 29, it could be 30 and 30, it could be 29 and 30, Right, but basically, the whole year is laid out. When you know the Mailad, then you know the entire, you, you know where Rosh Hashanah is, the year falls into place. Now, as a side note, you could have Rosh Hashanah occur after the Mailad. There are, there's, there's a famous rule, very famous rule, which is known as Loi Adu Rosh. Some of you may have heard of this rule. Loi Adu Rosh means that the Rosh Hashanah cannot fall on the days of Aleph, Dalad, Vav. Adu is Aleph, Dalad, Vav. Aleph is one, is Sunday, Dalad is Wednesday. Vav is Friday. Rosh Hashanah, if you look at the calendar, Rosh Hashanah will never occur on a Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday. And the reason for this, the, the rabbis were, were afraid that we, if we would allow Rosh Hashanah to be on a Wednesday or a Friday, then Yom Kippur would be on a Friday or a Sunday. Now Yom Kippur is like Shabbos. Right? We know Yom Kippur is like Shabbos. You can't do any malach, you can't cook, you can't, you can't do anything. So imagine, the Gemara goes for various examples, which I'm not going to address, but just... just an example that we can relate to very much would be candle lighting. If Yom Kippur would be on Friday, how would you light candles for Shabbos? And if Yom Kippur would be on Sunday, how would you light candles for Yom Kippur? You couldn't. You would be stuck. So that's not the Gemara's example, but that's just a simple example to illustrate the problems of having Yom Kippur on a Friday or a Sunday. So, so the rabbi said, we're not going to let this happen. If the Moilet occurs on a Wednesday, we're not going to let Rosh Hashanah fall on a Wednesday, because if Rosh Hashanah is on a Wednesday, then out of the days, you'll see Yom Kippur is on a Friday. We can't have that. So Rosh Hashanah is going to be pushed up a day. In fact, the whole year, therefore, gets pushed up a day. Your birthday is a day later. Bar Mitzvahs are a day later. Pesach is a day later. Sukkot, everything, everything is a day later. But Chazal had that ability. Those are, they, there are other reasons to push off Rosh Hashanah. The second reason, very interesting, is, is this opens up a whole new discussion, a, a very interesting discussion. This is what's called a what's called a Moilat Zakeh, which means if the new moon occurs at noon or later, the Rosh Hashanah is pushed off to the next day, which means if the Moilat occurs... On, on, let's say, on a Monday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 
Rosh Hashanah is pushed off to the next day. The, Rosh Hashanah, right, 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 the Mile of Tishrei. The Mile of Tishrei is on Monday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Then Rosh Hashanah... Wait, 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 the Mile is the birth. Is, the Mile means birth, right? Is the moment of the new moon. The Mile is the moment when, on average, based on average time, that the, new, that the moon is between the earth and the sun. That the moon goes around the, the, the earth, and then every 29 and a half days approximately, and at, at a certain moment, they're all lined up, and then you can't see anything, and then there's a rebirth. There's a, there's a, there's a small sliver. Now, you really can't see that sliver right away, right? You can't see it. Takes, it takes, nowadays, it takes between about 16 and, uh, between 14 and 16 hours. I think with the, with the telescope, you can see it after 14 hours. Without a telescope, maybe after 16 hours. Under the best circumstances, to be the right place, the right time, and the right time, etc. It takes that long to see. Now, if the Mila occurs at, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Rosh Hashanah is pushed off to the next day. So if the Mila, the new moon, occurred at 2 p.m. on Monday, then Rosh Hashanah is, is uh, on Tuesday. And if the Mila occurred at 2 p.m. on Shabbos, on Saturday afternoon, then Rosh Hashanah can't be Sunday, because Loya the Rosh, and it can't be on, so it's pushed off to Monday. Now, what's very interesting, this is another very important historical note, the, the Bala Ma'or, which, which is a commentary in, in many various tractates in, in Gemara, on this topic of talking about why, why do you push off Rosh Hashanah if Rosh Hashanah occurs at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So the Bala Ma'or goes into a, a, a fantastic discussion of the globe at large, and who's going to see that new moon, and when they're going to see that new moon, and how long it takes to see the new moon, and he's explaining the Gemara. I don't have time to get into the mechanics of this. But in his discussion about Baal the Chazanish, who lived, who passed away some 60 years ago, understands the discussion of the locations of, the, of, of where people will see the new moon and how they're going to go to Bastin. We're trying to mimic what would be if there'd be a Bastin, a court that we could go to. And in that discussion, the Chazanish says, you know what he's talking about? You see from the Baal Moor, the International Date Line, which is a whole different discussion. The International Date Line is, of course, a line in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which is, which is a, it's an imaginary line. You see, there has to be, if, if the globe is round, I'm getting off on a different topic, but it's really a, an offshoot of what we're talking about, and that is, if the, glo- the globe is round, there has to be a point where the day changes. What do I mean? Let me give an example. If I would get into a rocket ship right now, and I would fly west, okay, I really can't do that because it's still Shabbos in Hawaii. I don't know if I want to do that, but let's, let's not worry about Shabbos for a minute. If I, were, if I were to get into a rocket ship, and I would fly... Every minute I would fly a, a whole time zone west. So I get in a rocket ship, and right now it's like 9 o'clock on Saturday night, and now I fl- a minute later, 9.01, I'm flying over my, my, my the town that's very near and dear to me, St. Louis, Missouri, where I grew up. I look down and I see, oh, St. Louis, it's 8 o'clock, it's Saturday night, very good. And now I go over Denver, it's, it's, now, it's now 7 o'clock, it's 8 o'clock in St. Louis, 7 o'clock in Denver, 6 o'clock in Los Angeles, it's 5 o'clock in Anchorage. It's 4 o'clock Shabbos afternoon in Honolulu. And it's 3 o'clock Shabbos afternoon when I fly over um, American Samoa. And it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon when I fly over the Howland, the Baker Islands in the Pacific Ocean, uninhabited islands. And now, if I would keep going, I'd come back to Baltimore. And I've turned my clock back an hour. So I, I land here and I say, well, I've turned back an hour. It must be Friday night. It's 9 o'clock. It's 9.24 p.m. Friday night. And everyone says, no, Rabbi Heber, you just flew around the globe in this rocket ship, but it's Matzah Shabbos. You're in the middle of giving a lecture, and you just took off 24 minutes to fly around the globe. Right? But it's Saturday night. We didn't change. But I said, one second, I turned my clock back an, an hour every, every minute. So what happened? So the answer is, there has to be a point where the day changes. Where, no, instead of t- turning my clock back an hour, actually turn the clock ahead 24 hours. And that actually takes place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? Right what after, at 180 degrees, right? In other words, the, the civil international day line is, runs through the Pacific Ocean, and it, it runs between the Howland and Baker Islands and, and really New Zealand and Kiribati, there's islands there. In the Pacific, there's actually, a, there's actually a, um, an island, there's American Samoa and Samoa. Samoa, a few years ago, decided they wanted to switch days. So they actually skipped the day because they wanted to be on the on the Australian side of the international day line. So they actually just skipped a the day. They went from Thursday night at the nine or ten o'clock to Friday night at uh, midnight. They went from Thursday night at midnight to, to Friday night at midnight. And this way they were on the other side of the day line. There's no day lines, it's not a it's not a real line, it's an imaginary line that runs through the Pacific Ocean. 
But, but what does halacha say as to where the international date line? This is a very important discussion. So the, the Chazanish saw in this Balamor in his discussion of locations the way where, the, where this international date line runs. And actually, according to, according to the literal understanding of the Balamor, it runs six time zones east of Eretz Yisrael, which would be a line that runs through China and Australia. Which, would, which means, without, the Chazanish says it can't run through land, it's based on other discussions, but according to the Chazanish, Japan and New Zealand are really the same day of the week as America. They're just a few hours back, not hours ahead. Which means, according to the Chazanish, right now in Japan, it's 12, approximately 12 noon, and it's still Shabbos afternoon. Even though in Japan right now, if you walk around the, the, the marketplace and you ask people what day it is, they'll tell you it's Sunday. Everybody will tell you it's Sunday. But according to the Chazanish, based on this Balamor, which was written six, some six, seven hundred years ago, there was already a discussion of where this international date line is in order to determine when the, where, where the new moon is. Now, there's a dispute. There's a famous story that was in the 1940s when the, when the Mir Yeshiva was escaping from, escaped from, from Germany, um, uh, from, the, from the Nazis. They came, they went actually, I believe they were on the, uh, they went to Russia, if I'm not mistaken, on the train. They ended up in, their first stop was Kobe, Japan, where they spent about a year, and eventually they ended up in Shanghai, where they survived the remaining of the, the, the rest of the war, and eventually they came to, most of them came to the United States, or went to Eretz Yisrael. There are famous people who were, went through the Shanghai, Robert Kronglass, who was the, the, um, the, one of the deans of Mashkiach in the near Yisrael Yeshiva, who was, went through Shanghai. So many, many great, many great Torah luminaries who passed through there. It was a tremendous salvation of, of Torah in America with that, that, that group of people. But they had a big problem. They didn't know what to keep Shabbos because they were in Kobe, Japan. And Japan, according to Chazanish, was, was really when they said it's Shabbos, it's really, uh, it's really Friday. When they say it's Sunday, it's really Shabbos. And it was a big problem in Kippur. Now, the, the, there was a dispute. The Chazanish held one way. Rabbi Chemo Chotovichinsky, whose, whose kever, whose grave I was like to daven at just two weeks ago, Tomorrow, I was, I was there a week and a half. I was there at Israel two weeks ago, and I, I, I wanted to dive him by his cover because I, I'd learned through his, his Torah, and I had this chus of, of finding it in the, in, right by San Hendria, right in the basic forest there by San Hendria. And Rabbi Chimichal disagreed. He held the international dateline is, is, is the opposite side of Yerushalayim. And therefore, according to Rabbi Chimichal Toshinsky, Hawaii is really a day later. See, in Hawaii right now, we said it's 4 o'clock Shabbos afternoon. They're reading Shal Shudas. In Hawaii, according to Rebbe Chaim it's really Sunday afternoon in 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 Hawaii. So you have this huge dispute between these. We're not going to get into the halacha. If you travel to Hawaii, New Zealand, or Japan, or anywhere in between, you want to ask a question. But it's amazing that this discussion, which is really in in American in, in worldwide science, this discussion is only about 150 years old. Because more than 150 years old, no one really traveled. If you, if you traveled there, you spent a month on a boat, and when you got to your destination, you asked them, what's today? Today, with international travel, this is critical, where the date line is. But all of this is already addressed by the Balaam War in his discussion of, of when and where and how, how the, new moon, the new moon takes place. Now, the other parts of, that are important are, the, of course, the, the, the Earth revolving on its axis, as well as the seasons. The seasons are, are, that relates to the earth going around the sun. So we have, of course, the, the, as we mentioned earlier, Pesach has to be in the spring. That's why we have an Ibr Hashanah, the Jewish leap year, which is this year is a leap year, is an extra month. The secular leap year is only an extra day because they're taking care of different issues. The secular leap year is taking care of that extra, um, extra six hours. Now, as we mentioned, it's not exactly six hours. It takes the Earth to go around the Sun, 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes and 46 seconds. Which means it's 11 minutes different than, than exactly 6 hours. So you'll say, what big deal? What's, six, what's 11 minutes? 11 minutes is a big deal. Because every 128 years, that, that 11 minutes adds up to an entire day. In fact, there was a calendar reformation in 1582. The Pope, Pope Gregory, known as the Gregorian calendar, changed the whole calendar, and he took 10 days out of the calendar. There were riots in the street. Imagine just taking 10 days out of October and, and no longer there. And there was also a change to the calendar that every 100 years, that's not divisible by 400, there's no leap year. So even though 2016 is a leap year, 2020 will be a leap year, 2024, 
2096 will be a leap year, but 2100 will not be a leap year to compensate for those extra, extra 11 minutes. This does have an impact on us a little bit because we begin the recitation of the Saint Talmud to Lavracha, which is, which is in our Shemun Asrei. We begin it on either December 4th or December 5th at Mariv, but every 100 years that sh- shifts. So in the 2100s, it'll be December 5th or 6th. And in the next century, it'll be, if you look in the old books, the old Svarim, it says the Talmud begins on December 2nd or 3rd. Again, it's a part of the Shemun Asrei that relates to rain, rainy season, and therefore it actually shifts based on, 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 on the seasons. But, but, but very, very relevant related to the seasons is, um, is the, the extra month. The Jewish calendar has the extra month. Why? Because the problem is Pesach has to fall out in the spring. The Torah says, Ki ha'aviv. We went out of Egypt in the spring. And therefore, Pesach must fall out in the spring. Now, what's the issue here? The issue here is that if you take 12 Hebrew months, it's 29 and a half days, as we said. We have a layout of the Rosh, which puts our Rosh Hashanah. By the way, I missed one point earlier, that Rosh Hashanah cannot be on a Sunday to ensure that Rosh Hashanah Rabbah does not fall out on a Shabbos. Because Rosh Hashanah Rabbah, we take the Aravas, we take the willows, and we beat them on the ground, and on Shabbos we would not do that. And to protect that mitzvah, that custom, they made sure that Rosh Hashanah Rabbah never falls out on, on, on a Shabbos. You see how care... The, the rabbis gave to various mitzvahs to make sure that we couldn't just do away with that mitzvah. People would forget about it. They would say, we didn't do it last year. They'd forget it was Shabbos, and therefore the whole calendar is pushed off an entire day because, because the rabbis understood that if we skip a year, people might forget this very, very important custom. But anyway, we have the leap year. Let's go back to the leap year. The leap year, the problem is, the Jewish year, if you add up 12 months, that are either 29 or 30 days, 29 and a half days, right? The amount of time it takes the moon to go around the earth, it comes out, the year, the Jewish year is only 354 days, which is 11 days shorter than the solar year. So what, what happened is, just practically, that would mean that the Hebrew year starts to fall back. Let's give an example. If Pesach occurs, Pesach occurs this year, on, um, begins on April 23rd. Next year, it'll be 11 days back. So it'll be April the 12th. The following year, it'll be 11 days back again, approximately. It could be the, the, the give or take. So that would bring us back to April the 1st. Now, if the follower, or March, March 30th, if there would be no leap, why is that so? Because it's only 354 days to get to the next Pesach, but the solar year, secondly, the, the solar year is 365 days, so it keeps shifting back. If there would be, now, the next year, Pesach will be March 19th, but that's the winter time. We can't celebrate Pesach in the winter. Pesach has to be in the spring. So how do we solve this problem? We have what's called an Ibra yar, a, a leap year, a leap, an extra month. So we have two others, which create bar mitzvah issues. I'm sure your son was born 13 years ago, which means he was born in the first other. If a child was born in a regular other, and 13 years later is the bar mitzvah, his bar mitzvah is going to be in the second other. Right? We, we do the second, bar mitzvahs are in the second other. But if someone was born in the first other, and 13 years later the bar mitzvah has two others, then bar mitzvah is in the first other, like it's his son. 13 years ago was also a leap year. So therefore, first honor to first honor, second honor to second honor. It's very interesting. You could have this year, in 13 years, is not a leap year. 13 years is not a leap year. Um, right? It's not going to be a leap year. So we can have very interesting phenomena. And you could have a boy who's born, let's say, on the 20th day of the first honor. We'll call him Ruvain. And then Shimon is born two weeks later on the fourth day of the second honor. So who's older? Ruvain's older. Ruvain's two weeks older. But 13 years, their bar mitzvah, you're going to have Shimon's bar mitzvah is before Ruven's. Because Shimon's bar mitzvah is going to be on the 4th of the regular Adar, and Ruven's bar mitzvah is going to be on the 20th day of the regular Adar. Ruven's bar mitzvah is going to be after Purim. Shimon's bar mitzvah is going to be before Purim. And therefore it comes out, it's going to be the opposite, where you have two boys in the same grade, where the older boy, his bar mitzvah is going to be later. Now if you had twins like that, one at the end of Adar, and one in the next Adar, that would be very, it would be expensive bar mitzvahs. You have two bar mitzvahs. Because <laughs> Ruben's bar mitzvah is going to be at the end of the first of Adar, and Shimon, his younger brother, his bar mitzvah is four weeks earlier. Shimon gets all the presents, right, because his bar mitzvah is a month earlier. Right, if you have twins, so that would be a, fin- a, a fascinating case of where, of where you have that. But why do we have this? To ensure, we want to ensure that the that the that the seasons fall out in the in the right in the right time. And the Pesach falls at the right time because when we have an extra month, what happens then is that instead of Pesach falling on March 19th, 
in three years, I'm, I'm approximating the days, it falls out on April 19th, approximately. It's a whole month later because you've pushed off Pesach. And therefore, we have that extra month. I'm going to take questions at the end. We have the extra month in order to ensure that Pesach falls out What's interesting is the Muslim calendar also works by the moon, but there's no, there's no leap years. So the Muslim holidays will fall out, Ramadan, which is their famous month of fasting, actually shifts in the course of the year. It moves back 11 days every year, and there's no compensation, there's no leap year. So there could be in the summer, and then it could be in the, and then it's in the spring, and then it's in the winter. It actually shifts all around. The truth is, if, if a Muslim person tells you he's 33 years old, he's really only 32 years old, because his year is 11 days shorter. So after 33 years, 33 times 11 is about, 300, is about 365, 363. But it's, it's, it's a whole year because there's 11 days taken out of every year. There's no compensation. See, in the Jewish calendar, you know, my Hebrew and English birthday fall out typically on different days. So I'll turn a new age. Usually my, um, my, my English birthday usually falls out first, right? But okay, so for a few weeks, you know, instead of being uh, 21, I'm, I'm either 20 or 21, right? Or 22 or 21. It's, it's only a few weeks, but the Muslim calendar is actually a, a, a divergence of age. If he's 66, he's really 64, and so on, because of those 11 days which, were, which, which are not there. Now, the other aspect of the seasons leads to another very fascinating discussion, uh, which, which also the, the place could grapple with, and that is um, what happens if you, in the winter time. you have a, the further north you get, the, the, the shorter the day. Right? So in Baltimore, in, in, in December, in the, in the wintertime, the day is about nine hours long. If you go to Montreal, it's maybe eight hours long. You go to Anchorage, Alaska, it's maybe six hours long. Eventually, you reach a certain point, the Arctic Circle, approximately, where, which is an imaginary line, where the days are, in the summertime, 24 hours. In, in, in the, right? And the further north you go, the longer it is, until, of course, you reach the North Pole, where it's six months day and six months light. It's interesting. Everywhere in the world has the same amount of sunlight if you look at the entire year, whether you live in the North Pole or you live in Baltimore, Maryland, or at the equator, you always have the same amount of time sunlight versus dark. Dark. Or if you find sun up and sun, da- sun down, it's going to be an equal amount of time. But it's just a question of how to divide it out. If you write the equator, it's very consistent. Every, it's actually boring. Every day in the equator is either 12 hours and 6 minutes, 12 hours and 7 minutes, or 12 hours and 8 minutes long, every single day of the year. Sunrise and sunset shift maybe a half, about a half hour, and that's it. It's, if, you're, if you run a congregation, it's very easy because your mincha time could be basically the same, you know, candle lighting time, you know, is basically the same all year. Again, there's a half hour shift, so you do have to be cognizant of the half hour. The further you get from the equator, the, the more it's spread out until you reach the North Pole, and it's six months light and six months, six months day, six months night. But you have communities where you have the Shiloh, which comes up. For example, in long year, in, in, in Barrow, Alaska, the sun rose this past Sunday. And you say, big deal, it rose here also. No, but it rose in Barrow for the first time in several months, because in Barrow, Alaska, the northern point, most northern, most point in, in Alaska, and, and also if you go further east to, to Prudhoe Bay, which is where the pipeline ends, there there's a couple months of summer, a couple months of the summer, the sun is up, and a couple months in the winter, the sun is down. If you go to the northernmost settlement in the world, is long year beyond Norway. It's 78 degrees above the equator. That's 12 degrees from the North Pole. There, the sun set on October 28th and will rise on February 14th. It's really a Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day there really has, has uh, extra special meaning over there. right? It c- comes up on April 20th. And it stays up till August the 23rd. Think about how long that is. That's four months where the sun is above horizon. It's four, for, uh, this year, that's before Pesach. Before Pesach, the sun will rise and won't go down until, uh, until after Tishbav. Right? That's an extremely long time. But it's, you pay the price there because it's dark. The sun is down for several months. And obviously, you have various halachic questions of how do you, first of all, how do you daven? In the wintertime, how do you dive in Shachris? Shachris is the morning. There is no morning. How would you do a bris? A bris has to be done only by day. How do you do a bris? And, and, and in the wintertime, in the summertime, how do you dive Mariv? Mariv is, is a function of the night. How do you dive Mariv? How would you make a Seder in Longyearbyen? The sun comes up 
on April 20th, the Pesach Seder, that's good Shiloh. The Pesach Seder has to be at night. You have to eat the matzah at night to be yaitzah and misachilis matzah. There is no night. This, the sun never goes down. You run into various issues of also Shabbos. When should you keep Shabbos? Because Shabbos is the end of the culmination of seven sun, sunsets. So, but there are no sunsets. There are no sunrises. So how do you keep Shabbos? So There's a great discussion about how to deal with this. The famous Tzach and Tzach and Tzach says you go by the closest location. Others say you go by cycles of the sun actually is rotating. It's just not going below the horizon. And you're able to make these, these various calculations. The Minkos Elazar has the best Tzach. Don't go. Right? <laughs> Don't go. Right? Because if you're there, you avoid. If you, once you go, you run, into, you run into all these various shots. I just want to end with a brief discussion of one more science, and that's chemistry. And that is a discussion of of, um, of, of how to, of how it relates to kashas. I work in kashas, and what's, what's very important is chemistry is very important because chemistry, they make many building blocks of foods, of vitamins, of, of supplements, of what we eat, really comes from, um, from, from various chemicals. And, and we want us to know what's, what's, what's synthetic is typically going to be kosher. Petroleum to raise debate. Petroleum-based items are going to be kosher. Um, unless they're produced on non-kosher equipment. But even a petroleum item could sometimes uh, be made non-kosher. Let me give you an example. I was recently in a factory in Germany, and um, th- this factory is probably the, 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 the chemicals that come there. It's actually the largest chemical factory in the world. Um, it's eight kilometers long. It's about 200 buildings, BASF. Um, and uh, it's, it's a huge, a huge complex. They make various chemicals. They make a lot of items that are... Um, uh, you know, just used in everyday life besides food. For example, um, they, they make a reaction, just two examples, they, they react isobutene, which is a chemical, with other chemicals to make something known as openol. Openol is a trade name. Openol is a sticky substance, and it's used for several things, different grades. One is, do you ever, you ever wonder if you, you ever post-it notes, there's a sticky on the back. What is that? That's a chemical. It's a special chemical made because it doesn't stick too hard. It's not like scotch tape. Scotch tape, it sticks. You can't, you know, it's, it's pull off. Sticky on the back of post-it notes are very um, loose, but yet it's sticky. And those, that same chemical, that's openol. That's openol uh, that, that's from. And that same chemical is used to make the sticky part or that they use in hospitals for adhesives or for bags that get attached. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's also the basis of refrigerator gaskets that are used. That same chemical, openol, is used as a fuel additive as well. Now you're wondering why do we give a, why do we give cautious, why do we certify refrigerator gaskets, fuel additives, and post-it notes? <laughs> right. The answer is because it's also the, it's also used in gum base. So the, we we certify the whole factory, even though different grades are going to different different items. But we give a, a, a certification on the whole factory, and therefore because it goes to gum, the gum base company says we want to make sure it's kosher. Put in the gum base. Gum base is actually a tricky ingredient because gum base, besides openol, which is a synthetic derivative, an easy ingredient, gum base also uses glycerin, which could come off of, and it could be animal derived, it could be not kosher. So gum base, gum has to have a good certification because of, it, of, of the gum base that's there. Now, what's very interesting is this company, they, they um, you could react two chemicals, and when you react two chemicals, you could react isobutene with formaldehyde. And that's a precursor to another, another tra- ingredient, which is known as citrol. Citrol is the precursor to isophytal. Isophytal is the precursor to vitamin A and vitamin E. Now, all of this is synthetic, at least the way they make it. But you see, just from these two chemicals, where you're reacting two chemicals, in fact, isobutene is poison. That's another the philosophy of Byron. The Byron created an unbelievable world that you have a poison chemical that really ends up in the food chain, in almost uh, in not everything you eat, but so many different things you eat, this is this is isobutylene, which is isobutene. This is a, a a safety data sheet, which says isobutylene is also known as C4H8, CH2, uh, etc. Um, and it's it's it says poison, danger, extremely flammable, contains glass under pressure, um, may form explosive mixtures with air, may cause frostbite. And it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty dangerous substance. It's also, it's also poison to eat. But yet you know, when you react it in a certain way, it actually 
ends up with vitamin A and vitamin E. Now you wonder vitamin A and vitamin E, well, if you don't take vitamins, what do you do? Because when you, when you eat cereal, you have a bowl of cereal, those of you who read the side of the box, you'll see that it's fortified with vitamins. I'm not saying necessarily they're buying the vitamin from there, but there's a very good chance that that vitamin ended up its way down. Now, this vitamin could be tricky because when I travel to Denmark as well for this company, this company makes a product in Denmark, in Denmark, they actually spray dry the vitamin components. A spray dryer is a big, huge device, a, a big piece of equipment, which actually they have a, a mix of these vitamins, which is an emulsion. They put it in a big mix tank. They run it in to a, a, a spray dryer, which blasts it with a certain amount of heat, and it, the water evaporates off of this, and, and, and now you're left with a powdery substance. It's mainly used in the flavor industry. Do you ever wonder when you, when you have lemonade, you have powder in the canister. Do you ever wonder how that lemon turned into powder? If someone sat there and squeezed the lemon out of the powder. How'd that happen? That was spray dried. They actually, they actually made an emulsion of, of lemon oil with multidextrin, multidextrin, which is a corn derivative. They had this mushy emulsion, and they ran it through the spray dryer, and the blast, if it came, evaporated the water off. You're left with a lemon-flavored powder, which ends up in a can of lemonade or fruit punch or something like that. That needs a heksha because spray dryers, they can run kosher products, they can run non-kosher products. These vitamin components in this company, in Denmark, and they do this as well in Germany, they actually will spray dry this. There are two ways to spray dry it. One is on a base of gelatin. Gelatin is a derivative from an animal. In theory, you can make gelatin kosher, but almost, I would say, 99.99% of gelatin on the market is, from, is not kosher. It's either coming from chazer, it's coming from pork, porcine gelatin, or it's bovine gelatin, which is coming from a cow, but the cow has not been shafted, it has not been ritually slaughtered. It has not been deveined, it has not been soaked, and salted, etc. And therefore, it's not kosher. So gelatin is a big problem. It's not kosher. When they spray dry it on gelatin, then it's not kosher. But if they spray dry it on other starches and so on, then it is kosher. We have to make sure the equipment is, is kosherized between runs. It's a complicated piece of equipment. These are just, just one little example of you have to, the chemistry of it actually works its way through the food chain. We actually eat these items on an ongoing regular basis, even though we might not realize we're eating it, but we're, we're eating it on a regular basis, and therefore our job is to make sure through, the, through understanding the chemistry of it and how it's made and what the potential sources are, we ensure that the food that you eat in the Star K and other conscious agencies is 100% kosher. I go to Vach. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Came about in regards to the timeline. The, the, the timeline. Year. The timeline was was originally the the, the Balama Or who lived, I would say, ago, about six hundred years ago. You're saying our dateline or the civil dateline? Just in general, like, I mean, like, when do we start having two others? No, the, the dateline is not two others. The, the, you're talking I mean, about like, the international dateline, or you're talking I mean, about? I meant to say, like, when do we start conversation with the leap year? Oh, that's already from the Torah. So it was in the days of the Torah when they were Makanish al which means they sanctified the new moon by sight, right. they would actually determine every other, they would determine if we have to add two others or not. Okay. That was done by the basin. In 359, when they made the calendar al Cheshben, which means by calculation, they, they fixed leap years. There's a 19-year cycle that we have. I'm glad you reminded me of this. We are in the last year of the 19-year cycle. This is the 19th year of the 19-year cycle. The 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 19th year of the 19-year cycle is a leap year. That's why actually you'll notice the holidays this year are very late. The last day of Pesach is April 30th. Hanukkah, actually next Hanukkah, extends into New Year's. It's actually going to cut into New Year's next year, which is very late. Hanukkah's not so late. Hanukkah is uh, earlier in December. You know why? Because we had almost back-to-back -back leap years. The 17th year of the 19th year cycle was leap. The 19th year is, again, usually leap years are three years later. This year is two years later. That pushes the calendar almost as late as it can possibly go. My question was, when, when firm actually took place, was that a leap year or was that a regular year? Not sure. Don't know. Okay. There is a discussion about it, but I... It, it, the, the Gemara talks about which... The Gemara Megillah talks about which other should be Purim. The Gemara ends up saying that it's the second other because we want to be Samach Ge'ula Ge'ula, which means we want to co connect the Ge'ula, the redemption of Egypt, which took place in the month of Nisan, that's when we celebrate Pesach, with the redemption of Purim, and therefore we connect the two. And there are connections, there's an obvious connection between Purim and, and Pesach, there are various connections, 
between the two. We say Mishnah is on a Marim Simcha. When other begins, we increase the joy. That's also because of, um, uh, uh, you know, we have both Purim and Pesach. So there's various connections. That's why, that's why we celebrate the, the, the second month. The Bar is the second month. Yard sites, it's interesting, yard site, a person dies in, in, in Adar, in a regular Adar, the yard site, the main yard site, according to Amidic Ashkenaz, the, the Ashkenaz custom is the first Adar. The custom is to do both, but the main one really is the first Adar, not the second. So it works on a whole different premise. Yes? This calendar was designed up to 6,000 years, uh, Jewish, Jewish calendar. So now we have 5776, so we have 224 left. Well, technically, the calendar will work. It will work even after 6,000. There is a discussion. If the calendar would go tens of thousands of years, then it would, it would, it would, it would drift in a way that would be a problem. But Mashiach will be here long before then, and therefore we don't have the problem. But it, it does work after 6,000. It does work after 6,000. There's, no, there's nothing that goes haywire after that. 6,000, it could continue for many, many, many years, even after that. So, it, it, so we it, shouldn't worry about it. Nothing to worry about, no. <laughs> no reason to change, no reason to do anything. Mashiach will come, they'll be Mekadosh, I'll be Cheshman, I'll be Re'i again. They'll have the base then, and we'll look, and we'll, we'll sanctify the moon, you know, the moon by, by vision, by sight. But uh, there's nothing to worry about. You know, there was a discussion that last year, two years ago, 2013, two and a half years, two, more than two years ago, remember Hanukkah fell out on Thanksgiving. Right. That was a big, that made, that made, I was waiting for this day for a long time. I saw this, uh, this coming a long time ago, and this was like a very unique, uh, unique event. Um, already people, I was surprised, because people were really tumbling early in the year on it. But anyway, there was a discussion of when's the next time this is going to happen. You know, they said, uh, you know, 65, 600, 65,000 years or whatever, some astronomical number. What, what, that, that would bother me when they wrote that, because, because, Really, what that's there is a shift in the calendar, very, very gradual between the Hebrew and the English days. So, I mean, before Hanukkah is going to be again on Thanksgiving, it's going to be on Independence Day first because it's going to shift through the calendar and eventually hit hit July fourth. But we don't care about that because Mashiach is going to be here long before that. Just when they wrote this in sixty five thousand years, it's going to be Thanksgiving. nonsense. Like, it's not going to you know, it's, it's, it, that's already the calendar will be will be Mashiach will be here, will be Bakash will be Re'iyah. And if you want to get excited about Hanukkah on Thanksgiving, get more excited about Hanukkah on July 4th, right? That's like, that's even more bizarre, you know, which will happen in 30,000 years, but the whole thing's a joke, right? It's all... Uh... Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.